When last I saw there, he showed me a large series of photographs in which he had succeeded in reproducing the effects of emotion and of thought. He has one of a child mourning over the death of a pet bird, where a curious sort of network of lines produced by the emotions surrounds both the bird and the child. Another of two children, taken the moment after they were suddenly startled, shows a speckled and palpitating cloud. Anger at an insult is manifested by a number of little thought forms thrown off in the shape of flecks or incomplete globules. All these experiments show us how much is visible to the eye of the camera which is invisible to ordinary human vision, and it is therefore obvious that if the human vision can be made as sensitive as the plates used in photography, we shall see many things to which now we are blind. It is within the power of man not only to equal the highest sensitiveness attainable by chemicals, but greatly to transcend it, and by this means a vast amount of information about the unseen world may be gained. To put the same idea from another point of view, the senses by means of which we obtain all our information about external objects are as yet imperfectly developed, therefore the information obtained is partial. What we see in the world about us is by no means all that there is to see, and a man who will take the trouble to cultivate his senses will find that in proportion as he succeeds, life will become fuller and richer for him. For the lover of nature, of art, of music, a vast field of incredibly intensified and exalted pleasure lies close at hand if he will fit himself to enter upon it. Above all, for the lover of his fellow man, there is the possibility of far more intimate comprehension and therefore far wider usefulness. No wonder, therefore, that when we learn to see by any entirely new set of waves in astral matter, we find quite a different world opening to our gaze. One change is that we find ourselves then able to see astral matter in other men, to look at their astral bodies instead of their physical vehicles only. I have written a book, Man Visible and Invisible, upon this subject of the higher bodies of man, which is illustrated with colored pictures drawn for me by one who is himself able to see these bodies. From that you will be able to form some idea as to how these things appear to the sight of the clairvoyant, and I think you will find it a most interesting study. The astral body is especially the vehicle of passion, emotion, and desire in man, so that when a sudden wave of some great emotion sweeps over a man, it shows itself by exceedingly violent vibrations of the astral matter. Suppose that with astral sight you were watching a man, and that man should unfortunately lose his temper. Instead of seeing the physical expression of annoyance, you would see a remarkable change in his astral body. The whole vehicle would be pulsating with a violent vibration and since color is only a certain rate of vibration, this sudden change would involve also a change in the color of the astral body as well. When we speak of the surging of passion, we are nearer the truth than we think, for that is exactly the appearance produced. As the man cools down, his astral body will resume its usual color and appearance, yet a slight permanent trace is perceptible to the trained eye. The same thing is true of all other emotions, good or bad. If a man feels a a great rush of devotional emotion or of intense affection, each of these will at once manifest itself by its appropriate change in the astral body, and each will leave its slight permanent trace upon the man's character. When we come to deal with that other vehicle of still finer matter, which we call the mental body, we find that also uh, vibrates, but in response to quite a different set of impressions. No emotion under any circumstances ought to affect it in the least, for this is not the home of the passions or emotions, but of thought. It is not a new idea to speak of vibration in connection with thought. All experiments in telepathy and thought transference depend upon this fact that every thought creates a vibration, and that this can be conveyed along a line of mental particles, and will excite a similar vibration in the mental body of another man. There may still be those who do not believe in telepathy, for it is hard to find the limits of human obstinacy. But this is a matter upon which any one may so easily convince himself that unbelief simply means indifference to the question. A man may remain ignorant if he will, but when he has willfully chosen that position, he has no right to deny the knowledge of those who have taken more trouble than he has. 
Here then are two of the bodies of man, the astral body, which is the vehicle of his sensations, passions, and emotions, and the mental body, which is the medium of his thought. But each of these has its possibilities of development, for at each level there are various types of matter. A man may have a comparatively gross astral body, which answers readily to low, undesirable vibrations, and by carefully working at it and learning to control it, he may gradually change its composition considerably, until it becomes capable of responding to waves of emotion of a much better type. In the mental body he may have a fine type of mental matter, or a somewhat grosser mental matter, and upon that it will depend whether good and high thoughts come naturally and easily to him, or the reverse. But this also is in his own power, for he can alter it if he will, and it is not only during his earth life that this will make a great difference to him and to his emotions, but also in the life after death. When the man puts off his physical body, he still retains these others, the astral and the mental, and upon their condition depends much of his happiness in the new world, which yet is part of the old one, in which he finds himself. Remember that these are matters not of mere belief, but of experiment for many of us. It will readily be understood that a man, when manifesting himself through one of these vehicles, will present to the world surrounding him an appearance modified by that vehicle. A man living in his astral body is living in his emotions. He can express himself only through them, and he can be influenced by others only through their emotional vehicles. That same man living in his mental body may well seem quite a different person, for in that state he expresses himself through his thoughts, and equal differences will be found to exist when he is using other vestures. So distinct are these various presentations of the man that though they are in reality only aspects of him, they are often described as though they were separate parts or factors in his constitution and from that point of view are called his principles. Diagram 21. When the student meets with this uh, word in our literature, he must understand that they are the constituent parts or aspects of the man, each showing a good deal of life and activity of its own, yet fundamentally all one. Here, then, is our theory, the result of our experiments, and explaining it to you, I am giving you the benefit of nearly forty years of work and study, slow, toilsome, difficult work of many kinds, involving no little self-control and self-training. I think that all my fellow students who have borne the burden and heat of those years will agree that it has been hard and slow work, but still a steady progress and development in many ways, and out of it all has emerged for all of us a certainty that nothing can shake, that makes us know where we stand. Out of it has come a firm and definite adhesion to this glorious knowledge, which has done so much for us which we find to account for so many things which would otherwise be insoluble mysteries, which stands by us in times of trouble and difficulty, and explains so clearly and reasonably why the trouble and the difficulty come, and what they are going to do for us. It is the most intensely practical theory all the way through, and assuredly we wish for nothing that is not practical and reasonable, humbly following in the footsteps of the mighty Indian teacher of 2500 years ago, the Lord Buddha. We would say to you that he said to the people of the village of Kalama when they came and asked him what amid all the very doctrines of the world they ought to believe. Do not believe in a thing said merely because it is said, nor in traditions because they have been handed down from antiquity, nor in rumors as such, nor in writings by sages merely because sages wrote them, nor in fancies that you may suspect to have been inspired in you by an angel, that is in presumed spiritual inspiration, nor in inferences drawn from some haphazard assumption you may have made, nor because of what seems an analogic, uh, an an, an, analogal, uh, an, an analogous necessity, nor on the mere authority of your own teachers or masters. But, uh, but we are to believe when the writing, doctrine, or saying is corroborated by our own reason and consciousness. For this I have taught you not to believe merely because you have heard, but when you believe of your own consciousness, then to act accordingly and abundantly.
Kalama, uh, Kalama Sutta of the Anguttara Nikaya. That is a fine attitude for the teacher of any religion to take, and that is precisely the attitude we wish to take. We are not seeking for converts in the ordinary sense of that word. We are in no way under the delusion uh, from which so many estimable Orthodox people suffer that unless you believe as we do, you will have an unpleasant and sulfurous time hereafter. We know perfectly well that every one of you will attain the final goal of humanity, whether you now believe what we tell you or whether you do not. The progress of every man is absolutely certain, but he may make his road easy or he may make it difficult. If he goes on in ignorance and seeks selfish ends in that ignorance, he is likely to find it hard and painful. If he learns the truth about life and death, about God and man, and the relation between them, he will understand how to travel so as to make the path easy for himself, and also, which is much more important, so as to be able to lend a helping hand to his fellow travelers, who know less than he. That is what you may do, and what we hope you will do. We have found this philosophy useful to us. We have found that it helps us in difficulties, that it makes life easier to bear, and death easier to face, and so we wish to share our gospel with you. We ask no blind faith from you, we simply put this philosophy before you and ask you to study it, and we believe that if you do so, you will find what we have found, rest and peace and help, and the power to be of use in the world.